Uh, good evening, everyone. We are absolutely delighted that so many of you have joined us. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like it to, to say, also say thank you to um, those uh, survivors uh, who, who have joined us from Belson and to those descendants of the medical students. Uh, it, it, we are very glad that you're here with us and we thank you most sincerely. Um, we are very, very excited and looking forward tremendously to um, pr pr Professor Chalakam's talk, but I must tell you just a little bit about him first. Um, Stephen is a professor of oral medicine at King's College, London, King's College Hospital, and he is also a medical historian, so he is ideal um, for uh, to talk about this program, to, to have written this program, because he has made it his business to find out so much about it. Um, he, uh, the, the, as you can see, the title of the talk is Remembering the Medical Students Who Saved Lives in the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen in 1945. Um, in fact, the uh, medical students got there in May 1945, they were actually, um, Belson was actually uh, liberated in April 1945. So uh, the students got there the following month. Um, there were 96 students and they came from all the London colleges, including uh, King's College Hospital uh, and um, uh, St. Thomas's and uh, uh, Guy's. 34 of them came from those, those hospitals. And um, they thought when they volunteered, they were going off to Holland. However, at the last minute, their um, uh, destination was changed and they found they were going to Belsen. And they um, uh, were taken in groups and they, they, they flew in helicopters, uh, to, not to helicopters, to, in Dakotas, to um, a, a, a town called Chelle, uh, south of Belsen. And then they were taken to um, uh, Belsen. Now this was 96 students and uh, they had some idea uh, of uh, what they might find because of the liberation in April and because of uh, Richard Dimbleby, Dimbleby's um, announcement. However, when they arrived, they were overwhelmed. The scale of this terrible tragedy and the suffering and degradation of people uh, spreading in, a, in, in colossal proportions. However, they were enormously brave. Remember, they were 21 and up to 23, and they set to, and I, I am now going to hand you over to Professor Chalicum, and he will take over the story. Professor Chalicum. Well, thank you, uh, Joel, and uh, th thank you, everybody, from the friends, um, and particularly uh, uh, reiterate that welcome to the uh, families of those that I'm going to mention. So we're going to start off um, in um, 1st of May, 1945, and as mentioned, the, there were six Dakotas that uh, set off um, from an airfield near Sirencester, uh, heading for Germany, for Pacelli in Germany, and uh, their cargo was indeed the 96 medical students, and, and as been mentioned, their initial purpose uh, had been to help starving civilians in Holland, but at the last minute they were diverted. So I'm going to give you a timeline of the students. So a little while earlier, in, um, in early April 45, the deans of the London Medical Schools had been contacted uh, by the gentleman in the lower left uh, corner, Brigadier Glenn Hughes, uh, second in command of the, of the um, medical uh, services in the whole army. And he asked the volunteers, uh, and 96 student volunteers um, were given uniforms, immunized against typhus. And a couple of weeks later, on Saturday the 28th, they assembled at the Red Cross in London. And then they, at that moment, they were told they were needed at Belsen, and the actual words were, would you mind going to Belsen instead? 
Uh, they all, of course, agreed. And um, next day they took the train to Sirencester and the trucks to the airfield. Uh, there are two different days that they arrived at Belson, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But on Monday the 28th, uh, after they, this month in Belson, they flew back to the UK, gave back their uniforms and returned uh, just like that to their medical schools, their lectures and normal life. And there is, a, of course, a tale to be told there. So near Science Center were these two airfields, um, as you see on the right hand side. Uh, so there were six planes, two made it, um, one via uh, Brussels, uh, and two um, only made it as far as Croydon. And uh, two were delayed uh, in situ, as it were, because of the freezing weather. One actually took off, uh, got his instructions to come down again. And so it did. And there was a, the initial humor then of uh, Forsdick, who's one of the guy students, um, as our carburetors had frozen and ice had started forming on the wings, a factor which apparently renders the prognosis of a Dakota's existence somewhat unfavorable. And so they returned. And um, these airfields, of course, were those which were manufactured really um, for the war and for the invasion of Normandy, for the um, uh, uh, gliders to go across. And so that neither are in existence, although their patterns can still be seen. So there were nine medical schools who contributed. Um, and they're listed here, the Guy's, St. Thomas's and King's, which is I'm um, associated with now through King's College, London. And, and then the, the Westminster Mary's, the London, Barts, University College and Middlesex Hospital. And there are three, um, St. George's, Charing Cross and Royal Free, who did not contribute students. And there may be a question to be asked uh, by the audience uh, um, about that. And on the right hand side, you can see they were given the rank of, of sergeant, all of them, I think they'd hoped actually to be second lieutenants, but they were given the rank of sergeants and certificates and, and uh, um, were fully supported at this stage. So they arrived in, in cell, um, cell A, and, they, and here is the picture of the 96. Actually, I, I've counted this many times and I can only make it 95 or even 94, but, but this is the, that's because two were ill when the picture was taken. Right? Um, and the uh, brigadier, uh, Glyn Hughes, is, is sitting there uh, in the middle, an amazing person as you'll hear. Um, and it was his initiative. So this is actually the, pic the, the only picture of all the students together. And then here's one of the guy students on the steps of uh, the many guys people would recognize as the uh, medical school, now known as the Hodgkin building. And uh, here they are actually, in a way, looking older. <clears throat> don't you think, then uh, being uh, sort of 21, as they were roughly at that time. They were all actually third year medical st students. The course during the war was shortened to four years. Um, and these were third year medical students. So they were really relatively inexperienced. And that's because the, they didn't, uh, the deans were unwilling uh, to really let the final year students who were about to take their final exams go. Um, and I do have pictures here um, and um, the Kenny family and the Mead family have, have kindly lent me some more information that I'll mention. Um, and uh, there's a story to be told by me, of, of many figures that you see, uh, not least here, Jim Gowans on the right hand side who became director of the MRC. Um, and perhaps again, somebody would, would, would might um, share that at the end questions at the end. And St. Thomas's, um, there's also, here they are, the uh, 11 or 10 of uh, St. Thomas's, um, and uh, Ren John Reynolds there is actually the father of one of the staff now at, who works at Guy's and King's College, um, and, and uh, A.J. Cook, uh, A. A. Cook there became um, head of the Army Medical Services himself and enlisted later on. So there's a, we've been learning a lot about what happened to the students afterwards. Um, uh, and so we have their, their names their, um, and they've all done great things in their own lives. Um, Alexander Patton became a Dean. Um, that's sometimes regarded as going to the dark side. 
uh, but he was a very fine dean and he also a sub-editor of the BMJ. And so we have quite a lot of information from him. So, so Sully uh, is, they're really right in the middle of, uh, of, of Germany. Um, and if you look on the right-hand side here, you can see that it's really um, Bergen uh, was just a few miles north of Selle, of Selle and the south of Hamburg, um, really east um, of uh, Bremen and, and north of Hanover. Um, and that was where the airport was. And so the students arrived there on those two days and then went off to the camp at Bergen. So Bergen itself, Bergen-Belsen, um, was the first concentration camp to be liberated. Uh, it, had, it was only uh, in operation really for five years, uh, really initially by the German army and then the SS. Uh, I put in red there where things went really downhill and that was the Commandant Joseph Kramer who came from, uh, Bel uh, from Auschwitz um, and was really responsible for the conditions himself there. It, it, the camp was built to hold about 5,000 people. And as you see, there were about 45,000 people interned in that. Um, there were a, variety, a huge variety of, of nationalities and about 45% actually were non-Jewish, 55% Jewish and about 45% not. And it was estimated overall, while this camp was in existence, at least 50,000 uh, were uh, killed. Um, and 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 Frank was one of the inmates who who perished there. So I want to say a little bit about um, what happened when Belson um, was liberated, and that is before the medical students arrived. So it was roughly soon after midday on April the fifteenth, nineteen forty-five, that it was liberated. They technically came across the camp incidentally um, uh, by uh, two Germans from the camp. Uh, um, finding their way under a white flag to the British lines and trying to establish a truce because of the, of the camp, which the British um, acceded to. Uh, they felt at the time that, that it might have been a, a moment of altruism on the part of the Germans, but it, it turned not to be so at all. It was because they knew that the camp was riddled with typhus and they didn't want it being established in the local population. Um, a, a, of German, of, uh, local German population. And at that point, of course, the point of liberation of Belsen, the war was continuing to the east. And that, that did have an impact. And, and that me meant that the British army or the Allied army could not divert huge resources at this moment to uh, Belsen. And that's why the, the uh, work of the medical, medical students was even more valued. Um, so, uh, Belton was receiving um, more and more personnel from Auschwitz and, and other camps as the, the Russians came in from the east. But when the British arrived and the Allies arrived there, there was still a total of 86 SS staff, including 28 women guards present, but a lot, that is over 200 already left and, uh, and capos of about 350. So it was bereft of anybody to look after the, the inmates at that time. Uh, and it, uh, as uh, Jill alluded to, it was uh, an absolute disaster. When the army arrived, their first task was to bury 10,000 bodies just lying throughout the camp. 10,000, huge numbers. Uh, the second major task was to begin to save as many of the remaining 43,000 still alive um, in a, a situation when disease was rife. And those diseases included cholera, typhus, a lot of TB, much more than they thought initially, malnutrition, sores, gangrene, diarrhea, and so on. Uh, um, but in addition to those um, numbers of SS, the Germans had left behind a, um, some Ger a Hungarian soldiers whose job uh, was to help, um, some, somewhat reluctantly, to, to help the Allied uh, look after the, the um, inmates. And this is taken from a, a British Army report at that time, um, and it doesn't make very easy reading, and perhaps I should just put a health warning for some of the pictures you see at the, at the below there, but it was a dense mass of emaciated, apathetic scarecrows, 
uh, huddled together, uh, no beds, blankets, many cases without uh, inside and out, without any clothing whatsoever, no, no self-respect. Uh, females in a worse condition than the men. Uh, the, as you've seen already, the dead lay all over the camp and in piles. Um, and the, there's the 10,000 corpses around and sanitation being non-existent. Uh, uh, at that time, pits, just a few rails, but actually the inmates, uh, most of whom could hardly move, uh, would defecate and urinate just where they were. So, so the, the stench and, and their conditions were just uh, appalling. And there, when the British and the uh, Allies arrived, there was no running water or electricity, which is a parting shot the um, Germans had cut off in the local village of Bergen, I think where the supplies came from. Um, and uh, they rather unkindly cut that off, and there would, had been no running water for a while. So actually one of the first things the British did on that day, the 15th of April, was to do an itinerary. Um, and uh, it was remarkably accurate, actually, but the, they um, found over 43,000 prisoners in this part of the camp. Over 15,000 were men, uh, as, as you see that with that breakdown of Russians and Greeks and French and Yugoslavians, as gypsies uh, and, uh, and Germans, but almost double that of women, 28,000 women, um, including uh, uh, at least 300 children in, in two big um, uh, camps as part of this. And, and again, they came from all over Europe. And this actually is worth emphasizing because it, it became a real problem in terms of language. There was no common language for the British to speak to all of the inmates when uh, the time came to give instructions. And in blue at the end, there was something else. Up the road was a, a, a barracks and there were another 15,000 pr prisoners there in rather better condition. They were largely Russians and Poles who'd, who'd arrived there fairly recently. So we're talking, in the end, over 60,000 people um, in this camp. So by the afternoon, of, really the first day, a day later, the 16th, a day later, uh, the um, army had provided water carts. The first thing was to get water in there and a supply of food. So they, they had their first food, the prisoners, for a long time on the evening of the 16th of April. Um, and you won't be surprised to hear that you had to be very careful about initial supplies. They had to be guarded because of this, the starvation um, in, in, uh, so that they can be dealt uh, out fairly. Um, and it was just a, an unbelievably large uh, problem to get feeding of, of 43,000 people with so, so few people to help. There were five kitchens in that. But what, had, what actually happened in the interim period and actually between then and when the medical students arrived, was that water and food was, was uh, taken to the various huts and left outside in the hope that people uh, in the huts would organize it so that they would make sure the, the weakest could be fed. Actually what happened is the strongest were fed and they didn't take a, um, any food into um, the, the, the very weakest who couldn't move and, and uh, just accentuated the problem. I won't dwell on, on this, but this is what it looked like when they arrived. So the, the, the live are um, doing what they do, surrounded by piles of bodies, um, um, with a little commentary on the right-hand side there. And nothing really had done, been done uh, for a very long, for months really, and for a week that, that totally without water and without food. So it was a, a, a very disastrous um, situation. Uh, the people in the huts, to, largely to, to um, create a bit of room, uh, uh, would themselves, the, the stronger ones, would take out the, every day the, the dead bodies and, and just add them to the piles. There's nowhere else they could, uh, they could put them. Um, uh, and even children who at play would have to pass all the, the, the um, rows of bodies. Awful pictures, aren't they? Uh, even worse than uh, the, the Allies, the British, dug out these large pits um, and, um, the, the, as I said, the first thing to do was to uh, get rid of the, uh, um, bury the bodies 
take take all the bodies from lying in the woods and in the camp into the the pits. So the exact number is not known, um, but uh, the the site, of course, is there, and and uh, the, the ten thousand, roughly three thousand, a pit were were buried. So. It's been quite difficult to get a really good map. And one of the best comes from the book by Ben Shepherd called uh, After Daybreak, The Liberation of Belson. Um, and um, Belson the, the, had several different components. Uh, true Belson, the camp we're talking about here is Camp One. Um, uh, here, uh, right next to it uh, uh, was a Panzer training school uh, and the, the Conditions could not have been more different. Uh, camp one in red was uh, wooden huts and the filthy conditions. The Panzer Training School, of course, um, had been built for offices and had luxurious conditions and, and hot showers and, and beds and, and the buildings were brick. Um, and so at that point, the plan was uh, hatched, I think, to uh, gradually move all the inhabitants from camp one into, uh, um, into camp two. So looking, looking at this uh, camp one, this is it. This is, a, uh, I think, the best map I've been able to find where all the actual individual huts have been identified. Um, as you saw, there were 28,000 women and the women were in, in two big uh, uh, compounds, um, one much bigger than the other for the 28,000. The children in, were in there uh, in the big camp two. The men uh, were in three small camps, but they're in one big area uh, there. So that's the 15,000 men in those huts. And uh, over here was the SS compound, and that would have had uh, several hundred people in there, inclu including the Hungarians, who were, who were the, whose job it was to uh, look after and guard uh, all the, the um, prisoners. So that is the the the, the camp, and here's um, some graphic details. There were there were sort of uh, wooden, basically wooden huts in this camp one. Uh, it's only a, a 0.8 of a mile by 0.4, um, and uh, 40,000 people uh, crammed into that area. And again, I apologise for showing you this, but the huts inside of the huts. Uh, was a variety of things. Some huts, like this woman's hut, had no bunks or beds and they just lay on the floor, which got, became filthier and filthier, of course, because many people could not move out and, do, and uh, uh, therefore dirtied where they were. Um, in some of the men's ones, there were um, bunk beds and the, roughly they had three people to, um, to each of the uh, bunks. Um, and then in one, so at one area, there, there would be nine, nine people. So eight, 18 men just in that area you're seeing, seeing there. The key medical figures, uh, uh, Brigadier Hugh Glyn Hughes, that's a wonderful Welsh name, isn't it? Um, he uh, was a remarkable man, and we'll come back to him. Ar Arnold Micklejohn was a nutrition expert, originally from Mary's, but came over from the States, from the Rockefeller. Uh, and, and from the second day, Colonel James Johnson, um, the senior medical officer, was the person who then took charge of uh, the camp. And they had to formulate, begin to formulate the, the plan. So the medical students, um, they were assigned uh, they worked in pairs. Each pair was allocated a, a barracks or a hut. Um, it was a triage. Every morning they had to separate the living from those who died. So immediately they had to decide in some ways who might live, who, who would live and, and, and who would not live. And the corpses were removed each day then by the, um, the regular units of the, these Hungarian soldiers. Um, the, the, those needing medical help gradually were transferred to a hospital, but the, the students themselves had built two, two hospitals out, out in the huts themselves before we did the main change. And their main function then was to supervise proper distribution of food. Um, uh, and, and this did, did in an amazing way, I think. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, severe diarrhea and dehydration um, for people who hadn't had, who had very little water for a, a very long time was a major health hazard. 
So the students scrubbed the floors, they, they emptied the huts, and as I mentioned, they fumigated two to use as a temporary hospital. They organized the fit of prisoners to, to help them in that. Um, uh, amongst the prisoners were at least 100 people, uh, either medically or, or qualified or nurses, and they, they uh, um, helped uh, willingly. To, um, they fed the starving, they identified them, had been two feeds. So they went in, of course, they, they into the huts every day and attended to the needs of the, of the worst. So they kept an awful lot of people alive, I think, at this, at this point. Um, and it, one must just recognize that there were some amazing people. So um, Dr. Bimko and Dr. Ruth Gutman um, here, I think actually Dr. Binko was actually a dentist, but she, um, they, they were, uh, I think, fantastic in, in giving help to the students. And they, they organized one of these medical huts, if I can call them that, with, with areas of, of, of typhus and, and, uh, uh, and, and TB um, in, a, in a very organized and clean way. So in the middle of all this carnage, there, there was um, some organization. Um, and just if you look at the right hand side, these are letters back by uh, John Kilby to his mother uh, uh, as they arrived, a place beyond all imagination. So this first part um, is really depressing. It originated for death by starvation. And, and the, as I said, that their first job is to find those um, and the dead and find them removed. But then there's the second bit, which reflects uh, this extraordinary thing where um, up the road, where the, where the German training school was, the, the, the quarters were magnificent. Actually, the, the students didn't live in them long because they were needed for, uh, to make it into a hospital and they went into tents. But at, at this point, the second day, um, it, it, it's amusing to see that they were actually given, particularly since they were briefed by Richard Dahl, they were given 50 cigarettes a week free. M more sobering is this one by Michael Davies, uh, also a guy, guy student, um, seen at the bottom there um, as a student and then later as a professional. And you can read this, uh, scenes of indescribable horror, filth, squalor and disease. Uh, been dying at five to six hundred a day. In the, he's had alone 300 patients um, uh, and then only a few able to, to, to be fit. Um, I'm very tired, we work a very hard 12 hour day. Uh, and then this uh, cry, the scenes I've seen here will be vivid memories for the rest of my life. And I think that's something to come back to, particularly in questions about the effect that this had on the, the students. And here's in hut 213, and, and, and I've been able to identify these individual huts because of that map. Alan McCausland, um, and who, whose daughter also did a thesis on, on Belson. Uh, their hut had a, a, over a thousand inmates and uh, Ian Wimster, uh, who is uh, his pair going around issuing cigarettes and a suite to the walking um, uh, and so few were fit, uh, um, they thought, at 20 out of a thousand. Um, and so you, you can imagine the, the, the scenes that they, they, they dealt with. I've been able to extract from the uh, British Army records, uh, I think, were, were, um, and records were, were amazing. And I've been able to extract the, the, the death toll uh, per day. And um, the, you can see that the average, you know, almost 800 a day beforehand, um, this is when it's first liberated, uh, to May the 1st when the students arrived and the, and the gradual improvement to, to virtually nothing. Uh, they arrived on this day to work, so, so it, it would be perhaps not able to attribute all of this great drop to them, but I think the continuation uh, was. And it, it is noteworthy that over 10,000 deaths took place um, in the first few days after liberation. <coughs> Pardon me, and one was asked why that should be so. So this is an important figure when we're talking about their contribution to saving lives. So a plan was hatched. The plan was to move uh, all the patients from uh, uh, and prisoners from Camp One into and construct a hospital. So the analogy with the current day of the Nightingales is uh, I shall um, uh, mention that the Camp <coughs> Camp One was going to be destroyed um, uh, and, and fumigated and, and uh, destroyed, uh, and the hospital for those who who needed 
con uh, was going to be constructed in, in uh, this camp too. <coughs> Excuse me. So the strategy was the evacuation. The inmates were called out uh, and, they, and I'm going to tell you about the, the human laundry. Transported to camp two, the brick camp, seen here on the right. And amazingly, 7,000 beds were constructed within one week and clothing and foot footwear found. And so by the 18th of May, the evacuation of the camp was completed. <coughs> Pardon me, excuse me one moment. And no, <clears throat> and no less than 14,000 patients were admitted to hospital. Now, if you think that guys in St. Thomas's each have 800 beds, you can see um, that this is what, uh, at that point, the biggest hospital in Europe. Uh, so it was a magnificent feat that they managed to do that. They, they, all the patients, uh, prisoners went through the, <coughs> pardon, <coughs> pardon me, went through the human laundry. And it was no old stable and they were deloused. They had to go there with, with leaving no clothing at all in their previous hut. Come here, uh, washed down by, by German nurses and doctors. And again, there's a little thing here that 32 of the 48 nurses, German nurses caught typhus. And there's a little story there if, if, if people would like to ask more about it. Um, they were scrubbed down in the, uh, the laundry. Uh, showered and then every <coughs> um, inmate was given uh, clean clothes which they derived from the local population. Uh, they must have used tons of DDT in this uh, episode because the students were actually sprayed with DDT morning and evening uh, and here a woman inmate is by one of the um, prisoner nurses uh, is being given a DDT. <coughs> so here are uh, uh, the new beds in the uh, uh, Camp 2. And then the old German barracks, it's the officers' quarters, was turned into a uh, part of this hospital. So there's a big transition two weeks in then when all these beds are constructed, those who are fit enough can actually leave the camp, went to camp three actually, and, and uh, as a transit camp can, but those who, who couldn't were um, put into beds in the hospital. And what you've just seen is this area here on the right hand side, uh, the large ward, but the, the, there were another 12 wards in this, and of course many other wards across camp two. And the students now changed from, uh, that very uh, heavy work into being more like medical students and being responsible with the sister for each of these wards. And this allowed them now to be, uh, to take medical notes um, uh, of every individual patient. And I'm very grateful to the relatives who have let me see some of these notebooks uh, of the uh, patient notes taken at the time in, in, uh, in Belson. And I've just picked out a couple here from David Sells Herwood. Um, at the bottom there, the query uh, asking in a 40, uh, 52 year old, asking about a, a tracheostomy because the, the breathing and the patient being diagnosed with diphtheria was moved. And here's a very typical one of somebody who's wasted, given treatment, given a uh, diet, um, and then just as they seem to be improving, they died. And there's it says no diminution of appetite in the day before death. And that became very distressing and very common. The camp itself, uh, camp one was finally evacuated and there's some sort of symbolic uh, flamethrowers uh, of the last hut to be um, destroyed on the, uh, it was sort of good riddance, riddance to um, camp one. At this point, they could relax a bit, and here's a nice, uh, um, this is a menu card signed by all the guy students. Um, and I'm just going to point out, because I know his son is, uh, uh, is on the call, uh, here's John Spencer Jones. Um, and, but everyone has signed, uh, uh, signed the card, along with Mickle John, uh, Glyn Hughes, and, and Lawrence, who, who was a person 
uh, very much involved in, in mentoring the students at that time. A lot of the students got involved in post-mortems, even the people that they had uh, uh, got to know amongst the, the prisoners. Um, but one needs to say something about the challenge of giving uh, nutrition to the starved, because uh, in, in some ways it was a, a, a disaster. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the medical aspects of what happens with starvation, but suffice it to say that you cannot just give food to people who uh, are starved to this extent. And there was no, there's no, no experience, I think, worldwide of the, this degree of starvation. So normal military food, which had been given so readily by the soldiers, actually, no, it killed them. Uh, even solid food killed people. They, they, uh, their gut was not able to take it or, or their, their, their circulation. Um, the, the MRC came in with, with Janet Vaughan with a, a, a peptide hydrolysate, which they thought would be wonderful. Uh, it, it was also um, not good at all. It had to be given by tube or IV. Um, and as you can read there, um, because the SS had injected, used uh, the IV route to inject benzene, uh, this was not a very favoured route for the, um, uh, the prisoners. So that was a disaster. The Bengal famine mixture, which they thought would be useful, uh, was again completely rejected. It was far too sweet. So the answer is uh, dilute soup. Uh, it, wouldn't, it didn't satisfy most of the prisoners who were starving. Um, but it, it kept them alive. You want small doses and frequently. And, that's, and, and that, in that way, you build up your, your ability to digest. And it, I'm sorry to say that then over um, 13,000 uh, inmates were, died after liberation, uh, uh, two, roughly 2,000 of those perhaps of, of taking the wrong food at the wrong time. So at the end of this month, they, they met on Monday the 28th, uh, a picture here taken in, <coughs> um, in Charlie, got together and into Dakotas again, our favorite Dakotas, back to Croydon Airport and, uh, and then back to their, uh, as if nothing had happened, back to their lives in um, the medical school. However, it was not without cost. There were illnesses amongst the medical students and, and uh, uh, two or three, a few years later, one of the Medical students surveyed all the others and, and asked what went on. Um, and he got, uh, there's about 72 cases here, but just to say that nine, nine of the students got typhus, uh, four of them got TB, many got other things. In 14 out of the 96, their qualification was, was delayed, which didn't please the deans of the schools at all. Uh, five, their working capacity was, was affected. Uh, and there was a, a, an investigation by the military um, into the ethics, uh, as it turned out, of the uh, sending young students into this sort of situation. But they, I think, returned, uh, and I think there was a great appreciation in the press, uh, Montgomery himself, uh, uh, um, and, and the press actually recognized their, their um, contribution. So these are cuttings from the papers at the time. Um, and, and a wonderful letter from uh, 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 Brigadier Glyn Hughes, um, and he is absolutely in no doubt that they, they had saved uh, thousands of lives by their, their actions. And that's a rather nice letter, I think, uh, from them, from the army. So it is that they deserve, uh, I think we make the case that they, they deserve to be um, uh, 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 represented and, and uh, to commemorate uh, their, their time there in Belson. And uh, we've organized uh, at least three, and this one is already up uh, at Clark's to their efforts. And this one is up at Guy's, and we're having further ones which are being put up at uh, St. Thomas's and King's to commemorate the, the service of those students. So I, I hope that I've taken you through um, roughly on time, a, a, a extraordinary period and, uh, and uh, contribution. Um, and I hope uh, you agree with me that it, it, it deserves to be remembered in the most appropriate way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a very detailed and uh, in absolutely 
uh, fascinating account. Um, and I particularly appreciated the photographs and the, the notes made by the doctors. It's wonderful that you have those. It, it makes the whole thing so immediate and brings a kind of reality to what seems like a kind of terrible dream. So um, I think it's, it's the most wonderful talk that you, you've given us. And um, I would like to, uh, to, to start the questions by asking you, um, if you've ever thought about writing a book about these uh, events, don't you think you owe it to the students? <coughs> uh, yes, indeed. I, I have also pledged to the, uh, the relatives uh, um, who have been so kind in letting me have new information uh, that I will write it, um, write it up into. Uh, 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 um, I know that there have been uh, um, some attempts to, previously to write it up, so it's got to be slightly different. Um, but there's so much new material that, yes, I'm, uh, that is a, a task that I'll set, set to, and we will have, a, I hope, a publication in due course, and maybe assisted by those very same fam fa <coughs> families of those students. That, that sounds a wonderful idea, um, especially as the, uh, you're still you're in close contact with those families, and you will be able to be very accurate in, in everything you write. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Emily. Um, she is our um, development officer and uh, administrator for the Friends. And she's going to be asking you the next question. Hello, yes, thank you, Stephen. That was so interesting. Um, I've got some questions that people have sent before the talk and during the talk, so I'll dive in. Um, first question is, do we know whether any of the students, as a result of their experiences in Belson, suffered long-term damage to their mental or physical health? Yes, it's a very good question, and uh, I strongly suspect that the answer is yes. Um, I think, like many people who go through uh, an experience like that, um, they didn't talk about it to their families. And I think uh, coming through this uh, throughout and talking to all the families is how little they discussed it, um, such an event uh, outside uh, um, their own experience. So these days we're much more attuned to um, looking at the, the, the mental health, but it, it, there's no doubt that that experience influenced a number of people. Uh, um, I mentioned that, you know, 14 students had, had their, um, graduation uh, delayed, the course was extended. Um, at least one of those who, who, who uh, got TB became a physician, a, a respiratory physician. Uh, Jim Gowans um, gave up clinical medicine as a result of these experiences there. Uh, I think it, it, as it happens, it may have been to society's gain because it became a very fine immunologist and of course headed up the MRC. Um, but I think there are lots of attitudes like this where, um, uh, where what has happened later in life has changed. One, uh, one other um, brother of one of the, the students said that he changed completely, lost his sense of humour, for instance. So uh, I think although we don't have the modern day methods of uh, assaying mental health, to the same extent, I think there's no doubt that that is true, that, it, that many of them were uh, affected, but we can't say how many. Thank you. Um, I think that answers Richard Hughes' question as well, that he's tight, but do let me know if you have another one. Um, Alan Thompson asks, could you mention the link between Brigadier Glyn Hughes and Blackheath, please? <laughs> Yes, isn't that nice? That so here is the major figure whose idea it all was, who has a link with Blackheath, um, and I suppose I better come out with it, um, Alan. That uh, uh, Brigadier Glyn Hughes was president of Blackheath Rugby Club for many years, as is um, Dr. Thompson right now. So that's a, a nice link. So he's a remarkable man, um, Glyn Hughes, who, who gave great service earlier on, but in, in rugby terms became a, 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 a president of the Barbarians Rugby Club, uh, which is, a, for those who know about rugby, is, is a very famous club. Um, and then 
um, later on, who, who in, incidentally, I think are playing England in a, a few weeks time. Um, and then later on became a long term president of our very own uh, Blackheath Rugby Club. So that, that, thanks for asking that, because I think it's a it's a, a, a surprising and, and very nice linkage with this uh, with the with the halls here in Blackheath. Um, now, Helen has her hand up, so I'm going to allow her to talk and see if she might want to ask a question herself. Let's see. <clears throat> You're muted at the moment, Helen, if you press your space bar. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Helen. We can well, uh, I just uh, I just want to say that how grateful I am to Professor Chalakon for this. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know how to describe my feelings at the moment. I am a Holocaust survivor myself, but not not from Belzen, but from Wuch L O D Z, um, where I had five years of hell, I just, I just can't have enough words to say thank you for this most wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you very much. And it really means, means so much for people like me who are survivors. And I, although I, I, I try to do my share by speaking to various schools and organizations for which I received the BM from our beautiful queen. But I feel that this, that World War II and the Holocaust must be remembered and program like this should be shown to a lot of people because there are people still who do not believe that this has ever happened. Thank you very much. Helen, thank you so much for those words. That alone has made it worthwhile giving this talk this evening. <laughs> So we have another question. Um, what happened to those prisoners who were liberated and survived? Um, it was a very tragic time uh, because when you, uh, under the circumstances that we're talking about, um, you can imagine there are about 30,000 uh, who uh, in a very short time were able to, uh, be well enough to to go on to what was called the displaced persons. Um, th there were a proportion who could go back to uh, their origins, but of course, in many cases, they could not because their 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 whole families, their villages, uh, their towns had been destroyed, and there was nothing to go back to. Uh, there was a, a Sweden at this time took quite a lot of uh, um, the, 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 the so-called displaced persons, which was those who did not have a, a place to go to. Um, some stayed there for quite some time, usually in Camp 3, until arrangements could be made. And a number of countries then, including the UK, uh, did take uh, some of those uh, ex-prisoners. Thank you. And Caroline asks, how did the supply chain work? How did they obtain 7,000 beds? <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. I think um, there's a, an interesting perspective with, uh, with regard to the local population. The local population, if I can take that in two parts, there's a, a food supply chain um, and there's a material supply chain. I think the local population were in denial. 
um, they were well fed um, uh, and the children in particular well fed and there was lots of food around. And I think the, the army was able to find various food stores um, around and uh, start to get the, uh, animals, pigs, uh, food, wheat um, into the, uh, the camp. Um, they uh, made the local uh, officials of uh, uh, the local towns come and see and stand on the edge of those um, burial pits um, and uh, get them to appreciate uh, what had happened in, in their name. Um, and I think that my understanding, therefore, that the, um, they were more ready to give up clothes, for instance, uh, uh, um, to the, the camp. I think with regard to the beds, that's a, a slight mystery to me. Uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, they went out and, and got everything that moved, all, all wood. Um, they found... Uh, um, uh, 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 various foresty places they made they made them they got them um uh, but the the, uh, the researchers don't actually tell me in detail how he managed um to to be so successful to get seven thousand beds in in uh, one week and the army had quite a lot of course in the second week the the um when uh, on may the 8th the surrender came uh, the the army were able to to allocate more resources and you saw that they, they allocated 3,000 men then to help build and they went out to the job so they they actually searched the the local uh, area for some some um, distance uh, to be able to get those beds and I suspect that some of those beds came from individual homes too but some of them became army beds so they did 7,000 the first week and a se another 7,000 the sec second week. It's, it's uh, quite remarkable. So Dr. Winterbottom uh, from Mary's, I uh, uh, think deserves great tribute for that too. It's, it's, it's sort of analogy with the current situation, isn't it? When we, we've got the Nightingale beds and, and we're building hospitals, but I think it puts it in perspective when you, when you think that this was achieved so quickly and, and, um, and actually with such effect uh, with 7,000 beds a week. Uh, amazing. Um, the next question is, when did the last student retire from the medical profession and are any still alive? Um, yes, I, uh, there were 96, of course, and I, I, I've been trying to follow that. The, the last student, uh, uh, to my knowledge, was Jim Gowns. I think he was 96 and he died this year earlier this year. Um, I tried to go and see him, but um, unfortunately COVID uh, um, and, and perhaps medical conditions mitigated against that. So he was the last, I think, uh, uh, alive. Uh, it's, it's delightful that we have um, the families here who, who can take this on to another uh, generation and, and actually contribute, um, I, I, I hope, to what we're going to write up in, in uh, due course. Um, so I, the, I have used the BMJ obituaries quite a lot to actually try and answer your, sec your first question. Um, some are, two of the students died quite early, one of, one of uh, or quite early in their 50s, 51, um, through, one well, through hepatitis. Um, um, and uh, I think uh, maybe both from disease, so they, they died quite early. Um, but many went on to have a very fl flourishing career uh, uh, um, throughout. And, and uh, one of the things that we've been investigating is actually their contributions of these students to society afterwards. Many were consultants, that many had started, started off psychiatry in Birmingham. Um, the, 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 the breast unit at Guy's, John Haywood, started a very famous unit uh, was started uh, by John Haywood, who was there. Um, so uh, uh, Gowans, I mentioned as, as heading up the MRC, that the, the, I think a high proportion of these students became consultants. And so they have made uh, major contributions in their uh, uh, own right. But they, I think, I don't get the impression from reading the, those obituaries that they, that they either went on longer or shorter than, than we would expect from you know, that cohort generally. 
Thank you. And what do you think of the ethics of encouraging 21 year old medical students to volunteer to help civilians in Holland and then be diverted to Belsen? Yes, I, I've, I've thought about this and, I, and so did the army. Um, I think the army did um, a, a few years after the students were back. Um, I did have an investigation which they they it didn't call it that but they basically looked at the ethics of that and and of course with what we know now um it's extraordinary that um we would ask 21 year olds in their third year of medicine to undertake what they did and uh, there's a bit more that i of course i haven't said i mean they're, they're taking part in the post-mortems and so readily and they are learning at that stage but but um uh, I think the knowledge of exactly what they were about to see, it wasn't clear. Uh, although Dimbleby had come in a few days after the liberation and sent back uh, those first uh, newsreels of what was there, uh, we understand that some of that was, was sanitised because it was just so awful. Um, and medical students um, may read a lot, but I'm not sure that they necessarily keep up to date with all those things. So their ready acceptance of uh, changing uh, was just done off the cuff, I suspect. Uh, they, were, they were already committed. Um, uh, and so if it had been slightly different and they, they had been asked to go directly to Belson and they had the knowledge of what they would see, it might have been slightly different. And certainly the investigation to the ethics uh, at the time came to that conclusion that, that um, in spite of the the, 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 the the deans of schools, of course, still have responsibility for their, the students under their care. So if you send students on electives, you're, they're still part of your course, you still have responsibilities. And I, I suspect that one or two deans did have quite strong reservations, not necessarily of sending them to Holland, but in sending them to a, a place like Belson and then hearing about the, what they faced at that time. And I don't think that would, is likely to be repeated if, it, if, if we'd started with the knowledge that we have now. Thank you. Um, Caroline asks, where did the German doctors who were in the laundry come from? Yes, the, the um, thank you. The, there were two the, uh, aspects of that. There were uh, German doctors, which they, they got from the German army who had been defeated and given up uh, um, locally. Um, very quickly, but in that second week they, uh, from May the 8th. So they brought in lo local German doctors and they got some from the army, uh, from the German army. And the same thing with nurses. And the, there's an interesting thing uh, with them both, uh, but particularly with the nurses, uh, it, in that initially they were very reluctant to get involved. Uh, I think as they arrived uh, um, at Belsen, they, they hadn't been... I think prepared for what they they saw either, um, but I think the reports are that once they realised that they actually uh, worked extremely hard um, uh, and uh, had no reluctance at all to get involved, but the the cost to them was that I think thirty two of them the forty eight got got uh, typhus because they're dealing and they're scrubbing down people with typhus. They, the British had, had been told that they'd all been immunized against typhus by the Germans, and this turned out not to be true. And so their susceptibility, I think, uh, then was because they were handling people with typhus every day. Um, and so one of those died and 32 um, got typhus. Uh, you would expect that the same might apply to the doctors. We don't have any, at least I don't have any information of whether the, or the numbers of doctors, German doctors who, who were involved, There's slightly less doctors than, than, than the nurses. I don't have any information as to whether they suffered that same sort of thing or whether they, they truly had been immunized. One suspects that they, they were immunized, the doctors, but not the nurses. Uh, and, uh, and on that topic of, of typhus, I suppose one should say that although seven of the medical students came back with typhus, uh, you, you might argue um, uh, that they were immunized quite quickly before they left. You might have expected that more of them uh, rather than less might have got typhus so that 
they had all been immunized, but they had a uh, few of them had actually completed the proper course of immunization. So there's another little ethical thing there. They were certainly thrown in at the deep end before they, at least the majority of them had completed their course, but happily the majority did appear to be protected in some way. I will now allow Joan to ask a question. Hi, Joan. Hi, Stephen, I just wanted to say that this has been the most brilliant evening I think it's been a fascinating story, very, very moving, and grateful to you and the families who've helped to provide us with this extraordinary account. My questions are really rather trivial compared to what has already been said, but I couldn't help reflecting when I saw the photograph of the 90 odd that were going to go to Holland, that they were all men. And I feel sure there were women students in the medical faculties of the time. And of course, so many British women as nurses particularly uh, contributed to the effort during the war. And my second point is, has there been any research, this is a much more wider question, into this use of uh, DDT when you saw them puffing away? And we now know it's... Uh, I just wonder if anyone's looked into that. That's, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Joan, for those, those, those kind words. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I hung out a, a little um, line earlier about the three medical students who didn't, uh, medical schools who didn't contribute. And one of those was the Royal Free. Uh, and a, a decision uh, had already been made that it would be all male students. So the Royal Free, being all female students, therefore didn't send. Uh, um, George, St George's and Charing Cross didn't either. Um, but at the time, uh, what did we have at that time? We, ha we did have about um, six or seven percent of, of students were female. But it, that had been a decision. And I think you would question it because you're saying in some ways that, that it was all right for nurses to be thrown into this deep end. And many of the uh, and one ought to say this, that the, the, the British nurses who took part uh, and with the Royal Army Medical Corps um, did take part in, in the, those hospital huts and supported um, that trend. And they certainly took part in the, when mm. it became a more proper hospital, the secondary uh, mm. level. Um, but uh, that would uh, um, that would account uh, for that decision that uh, the, the, uh, the the male versus um, uh, female. I think. What, uh, sorry, the other part of the question was DDT. Oh yes, the DDT. Yes, uh, um, that's a very interesting one uh, because they did look at that. Uh, of course, subsequently we we think of DD, DDT being neurotoxic. Mm -hmm. um, um, under the circumstances uh, that are there, they, they, they use clouds of it on every patient and all the students. There's no record of them. Uh, I think it was looked at by the RAMC. There's no record of any neurotoxicity subsequently um, that they suffered, nor, uh, nor anywhere it, it, with the inmates, the patients, prisoners themselves. So mm -hmm. um, in spite of, of it being clouds and... and um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I suppose, hundred weights of it um, mm. or more. Uh, there, there's, it's interesting that the, the theory and practice, I think they were rather, uh, it was rather more important given the, um, the typhus, which was killing people, um, mm. that that was far more important than any slightly more theoretical things of neurotoxicity. Thank you. Okay, we've still got a few more questions. Um, someone asks, are you aware of a book written by a survivor of Bergen-Belsen, The Choice, by Edith Eager? Um, I've read as many, many as I can. I'm aware I haven't read that. But I, of course, there's uh, Peter Lantosh and, and Parallel Lines, um, who's in London. And he was uh, also one of the children in, um, in Belsen. Um, um, and it, they, of course, uh, and then parallel lines. So he, he is one. The um, it, it is very salutary reading. I think there was a, a great effort uh, within the the women 
in Belsen to protect the children. Uh, with 28,000 women, and many of whom are childbearing age, the, um, there were many people who came in already pregnant. Um, and it is, uh, as you might guess, there were many more were made pregnant while they were in Belsen. Um, on the, the medical prisoners, there, there was a, a one obstetrician who uh, I think was delivering five to seven women a day within in Belson. So a lot of these children, some children came in with their uh, families uh, and then were, were linked only with their mothers. Um, and then others were actually, um, how shall one put it, conceived and born within Belson. Um, uh, but it's, uh, I uh, thank you for that. And I would certainly um, uh, commend all books uh, about this uh, should be um, uh, read if, if one possibly can. Um, Rosemary comments, um, I just wanted to echo what Helen said. My cousin who now lives in Canada is a Holocaust survivor and has been encouraged to write about her experience. Is there any way I could get this talk to her? I'm sure there is. Um, I'm sure we're, we're making a recording of this, so I'm sure we can share it with you. And I'm sure Stephen would be happy with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, I think Helen's point earlier that the, the more this is dis discussed um, and appreciated, the, the, the better it, it is. We, I think one of the th reasons for doing it, it should be known it, and the details should be known. And there, there's more than one aspect. There's the, the Holocaust um, and liberation aspects. And, and, and tonight we've f rather focused on a, a very specific thing, which I, I didn't know about um, uh, until uh, a year or, or 18 months ago. Um, uh, but but uh, once you do know about it, you realize how important it is to, in my case, to research and put it together. Uh, and, and, and try and, and disseminate it to, to others as, as we're indeed doing tonight. Tony asks, what was learned from this experience about the medical response to emergencies and how has this response evolved since then? Uh, yes, it, it, I won't of course have all the answers to that. I, but, but I, um, I think there, my impression from the uh, reviews that, that later on, the, the Royal Army Medical Corps in, in 1984 held a, a meeting um, to review uh, these types of things and the role of the, of the, of the uh, medical students and elsewhere. <coughs> Curiously, the medical students, um, this, this is an aside, so I'll not come back to the question. The medical students never got together here they were, 96 students, and under these circumstances, uh, they never had a debrief. Um, they never all got together. They, they may may well have done within the individual hospitals, and I know the, the students at the Westminster, for instance, were, were quite a close-knit group, um, but they never met together and had a debrief, which, which you would never do nowadays. But in this debrief, they, they, there are a lot of lessons to, to learn. Um, I think um, th there was an incredible organisation uh, which went into play. So some things I thought were extremely good. And I mentioned how they did an audit, if you like, an inventory on that very first afternoon. Um, and and I, I think I forgot to say that the, the reason the British had to do this audit is that the Germans had, who normally would have kept very good records, had been told by Berlin to destroy all records of the camp. So uh, the Joseph Kramer, who um, was the the, the 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 very nasty commandant um, had acceded to that request and had burnt all records. So the a slide that, that I showed earlier, which then showed the forty three thousand and gave a breakdown of the numbers of of, of polls or checks or whatever, uh, that was an amazing undertaking to come up with that figure, uh, which was done by that Wednesday evening. So within, within uh, uh, you know, half a day, they had got that. At the same time, they needed to do that to uh, understand what the needs were. At one level, the needs are pretty obvious, but the, at another level, the, the, the decisions they had to make very quickly um, with that number of people, uh, clearly, first of all, had to be about 
water supplies and food supplies. Um, the water had been cut off. Um, the the electricity electricity had been cut off. And, it, and it, um, I might just, if I'm permitted, just say uh, I learned from one person who wrote to me that he'd been a scout uh, and had been in, in uh, Belson at a very early stage and actually had, had had nabbed one of the battle flags, the, the SS flags over uh, which flew over Belson, um, which was taken back to Surrey. Um, but his story is that, that he was the person who was told to go to um, Bergen and um, uh, to get the electricity on. Um, and they put Kramer into the one safe place while they went and did that, which was the cold store, because it was only uh, uh, lock, uh, unlockable from the outside, not the inside. Uh, and they went off to uh, Bergen, got the electricity supply on, and got on with their work, uh, got the pumps going to get the water. And it was some hours later that they remembered that the electricity supply would have also been for the big fridge there um, in, in the big fridge. And uh, inside it was a, it was a, a hypothermic uh, Kramer when he was pulled out, but uh, he was warmed up uh, without much sympathy. So I think the lessons they learned, I think, uh, have to be built on what was very good. Uh, and what was very good is that the fact that they, they devised this plan very early on and began to institute it to save people, uh, which was about the food and the recognition that, that, that you had to look after the weak as well as the strong. Um, you couldn't rely on, uh, under these circumstances, the strong to feed the weak. Uh, that had to be the students and the nurses um, uh, and the, and the, uh, the hundred medical uh, people who, who were amongst the prisoners. I think what was uh, they really uh, learned a lot about was how to feed people. Um, they, they did not realize that, uh, appreciate really, that they came in with the Bengal fa famine mixture, which may have worked well in Bengal, but was a disaster uh, here in, in Belson. Uh, the they natural inclination of people to give food to people who haven't had any. Uh, 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 one should, uh, I, I wasn't going to go into all the medical things, but one should recognize that the heart becomes half the size, um, the circulation becomes half the volume. Um, because there's so little protein, in spite of that, there is edema in the, the legs. The gut um, it becomes transparent, there's, there's nothing, there's no digestive things. Um, and, and what we rely on, which are called peristalsis, to get all the, the food going down the, the gut, it's not working. So to give people solid food, uh, that would never occur again. Um, to come in with IV, it was with the, such the best intentions, that's a way to get fluid in normally. But under these circumstances, uh, um, it wasn't going to be something you could do, nor, nor were, were, were prisoners readily going to be acceptable of having Ryle's tubes put down um, and feeding gastrically. So I think the lessons we've learned and the, the army learned when they had this review uh, was about nutrition, it was about organization, but it was also, I think, to celebrate that, that, that as they look back, many of the things that the, the army did were actually very good indeed. Um, Mariam asks, um, why were there no volunteers from Westminster, Charing Cross and the Royal Free Medical School? But I think you've already answered that. Do you have anything to uh, there add? Were from, uh, no, no, um, there were from the Westminster and they, they the Westminster students made a real contribution. Um, and they also were very forward in, in um, uh, cleaning out one of the huts for, to make a, a, a temporary hospital hut. So the mess, the, the uh, I think many of them, the Westminster students had actually come down from, from Cambridge and, and then done their, the rest of their um, medicine um, at the Westminster. So it was uh, it was only uh, Charing Cross um, and the Royal Free uh, and who did I say the, the third who 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 didn't and um, they had been um, and George's they, they sorry the, the Charing Cross. Um, they had been evacuated, I think, and they were in uh, no, uh, 
I'm not actually sure uh, whether they could not have still sent students, but they had been ev evacuated out of London. So I do not know the detail of that, but that's a reason that, that was given why they didn't contribute students. Thank you. Um, Julia asks, do you know of any, if any of the concentration camp survivors have written about their experience and memories of meeting any of the medical student, students during their time there at Belson? Uh, that's an interesting one. I, I, the, there are not many who have written. Uh, 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 Peter uh, Lantos, uh, I, I'm sure in Czech that should be Lantosh, not Lantok, but uh, I asked him, um, uh, but he was only um, eight, I think, at the time, or maybe even younger, in Belsen, and he told me something I, I hadn't uh, appreciated, that um, I knew that coming into Belsen, um, even on the 15th or the day before, the 14th of April, um, I think 500 women uh, came from a, another concentration camp. So as the Russians came in from the east, uh, there were uh, um, prisoners from Auschwitz and, and various Buchenwald and so on. I think 500 uh, arrived the day before. Um, so that's why it got bigger and bigger um, as, the, as the war progressed. What I hadn't realized, and talking to then, if you like a survivor, but one of the children, is that in that same week, um, some of the, uh, the um, prisoners had been sent by train um, out of uh, um, Belsen, and they were going to go to um, another concentration camp in Hungary, um, they never made it because the, the, the um, Americans, the, the, the train ran, ran into, as it, as it were, into the front line of the Americans. And so they were liberated on the train. Um, and, and because he, he left a, a, a few days a week before the students arrived, um, he, he never actually then saw the students. He knew them and he, and he uh, did meet some later, um, but they weren't actually able to share that experience because they hadn't been there at the same time. Thank you. So I've got one more question from Caroline and then um, Tina has her hand up to ask a question as well. Um, Caroline asks, my uncle was a soldier in one of the original convoys which ent entered Belsen um, and has found it ever after difficult to talk about his war experience. You've talked about the history of medical students. Has there been any research done uh, into the subsequent, subsequent life of the soldiers, i.e. PTSD? Yes, that's a, I think that's a very uh, good and important question. Um, I have actually been making a, a, a little list of all the doctors in the Royal Army Medical Corps um, as a sort of addendum, because uh, you're absolutely right. Although we have talked and concentrated on, on this unique contribution of, of uh, very young men, uh, the the was a considerable contribution from the casualty clearing stations um, of the doctors uh, who were part of the, the army. Um, and there, there, there were two groups really, one, um, one up to May the 8th when the, the war, uh, um, when, when the surrender in Europe came and, and uh, were who had been assigned to Belson um, and there's the, at that point, they were able to, um, I think, allocate more resources, including another casualties clearing station, who had previously been following the war front, of course, and picking up casualties. Um, and um, I, this really gives me an opportunity to say that we should also, in this, really be recognizing the contribution of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Um, I, I, I've been as I say, collecting the names and what ha uh, I've got a about a dozen uh, of individuals um, uh, and what happened to them. Um, uh, but that for me uh, uh, is, is an area of research which is not complete, but it is good to recognize their countries and indeed the nursing, uh, uh, which goes with the RMC who, who were terrific. Um, I know of no debrief or, or looking at um, any post traumatic uh, stress disorders, we'd call it now. Uh, there's no doubt that they, um, my impression is, is rather like the medical students, that there was a reluctance uh, ever to, to talk about it on their return. 
Um, now I'm going to let Tina ask a question. Okay, hi Tina. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, um, I know that you've lived with this story for over a year, Stephen, but I think it would be nice for you to tell everyone what brought you to starting this research, this, this sort of mission that you've been on to unfold this story for us. Uh, thank you. That's a, it's a, a nice question and, and um, one I hoped that um, somebody would ask. Um, there are two prongs to this. Uh, one is that, um, uh, Jill, in your introduction, you mentioned about the history of medicine and I've been very much involved in recent years in the, the, the history of medicine. And the more you know, the more fascinating it, it, uh, it is. And Guy's uh, medical students, uh, medical years, have an alumni um, an, an annual alumni reunion and I gave a talk one year uh, on um, some of the uh, in relation to the, some guy, guys um, uh, consultants and I was approached later by Stanley Davis um, who uh, again I'm very pleased to acknowledge and, and his daughter is, is married to, to um, the son of one of those um, medical students uh, which is Kilby, John Kilby and um, Stanley asked me whether I would be prepared to, to uh, investigate and research about this and put together a talk. And really it's, it is to Stanley Davis, who's now uh, well into his nineties, um, who then put me on this track. And, and we actually went off to the welcome and other places um, ourselves and looked up the, the documents um, and, and uh, um, I, I suspect that without his input and his enthusiasm for starting me off on this route, um, I, I wouldn't have been able to give this this talk. Um, so just to Stanley um, and his family that um, I owe um, a lot because it's it's knowledge that I'm very pleased to have been able to to get and to research. Uh, and I should say that it's it's the the two big areas which which they do have um, the, in different ways quite a lot of information. Um, one is the, the, the Welcome Institute, Welcome Collection in, the, in Euston Road, who have a lot of original manuscripts. And another is the Imperial War Museum, who, who have a great record, um, all, all digitalized of pic pictures and so on. And, and that's great. Um, and the other is, I think, uh, which I hadn't mentioned, is, is that all medical students who went had been encouraged to write up uh, their experiences uh, um, locally and the, almost every London medical school at that time had a gazette so the London and Westminster and Guy's and, and King's had a, 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 a gazette where uh, published uh, uh, regularly and they, these are a, a mine of information there's some lovely um, uh, tales and uh, accounts of their time in each of those hospitals so I think about uh, eight of the nine hospitals had gazettes and, and uh, that's been a, a wonderful source of information too. So, so Stanley and his family, um, uh, all those sources have, have led me to where we are today. Thank you. Um, Jill, would you, do you have an, a question you'd like to ask or if anyone else would like to? Um, well, I've asked my question and I've um, listened with gratitude to all the wonderful answers that Stephen has given. So maybe this is now the time to wind the, 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 the talk up. So I should like to say a huge thank you to Stephen for his inspirational talk. Uh, I'm sure we will not forget this talk. And he has, he, this is a major achievement on his part. And I am so grateful to him for coming to Blackheath Halls to give this talk. And I hope very much to see more of him and hear when he has published his book on the subject. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Jill. And, and thank you to so many people who have uh, tuned in, if that's the right term now, who tuned in to listen uh, this evening. It's not the, end of the tale it's still the beginning thank you very much Stephen and thank you so much for hosting Jill and for the friends for putting on the event 
Um, I hope you've enjoyed this free event hosted by the Friends of Blackheath Halls. If you are able to donate to Blackheath Halls, please do so via our website or contact me, Emily. Have a lovely evening. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Bye.